Um, let me discuss first the G hat animal. So it has to do uh, with the Gromov Witten theory of X. And um, so here, um, first let me tell you about G without the hat. G of T is a power series. Some C, uh, well, my CD, CN, T to the N, where EN is essentially a gram of written number. Let me just uh, write first and comment later, 0, 1, D. Um, okay, let me just write this then, sorry, N. So I, the N minus 2 of upper star of a point. So what is this? So here, x0, 1, n is the moduli space of maps, morphisms, f from a genus 0 curve with one marked point. OK, so that's a genus 0 curve. For example, it could be P1. So that's the first zero here. Uh, it has one marked point here. X is one marked point. That's the one here, uh, mapping to X such that it has anti-canonical degree n. So the degree of f upper star minus kx equal n. And you see it's always uh, a, so it's strictly positive because x is final, OK? So this is always strictly positive as x. This thing is, is out. And you know, let me go, not go into the details of this. It's not clear that I will discuss this material, perhaps towards the end of these lectures. I'll tell you a bit more about these things. Uh, this is the Konsevich space, and you, you know, there are some technicalities in compactifying it, and so on and so forth. And then here, I'm really integrating on the virtual fundamental class of it, which uh, I'm certainly not going to talk about. Um, but let me tell you about this Psi thing. Psi is the first churn class of a line bundle on that space. Uh, yeah, sorry. First, perhaps I should say the evaluation map. Uh, this thing has an evaluation morphism to x, which takes the map f to the evaluation at the marked point. And so, you know, that allows me to pull back to this space the, uh, the cohomology class of a point the general point on X. If you like, I'm looking at all the curves, all the P1s of degree N in X that pass through a general point. <clears throat> so is this C1 of L where L is a line bundle On X, uh, zero is the line bundle. On X, zero, one N, which, you know, with fiber, 
L at a particular map, the cotangent space of the curve gamma at that at the marked point x, little x. That's a little x, the marked point. Okay. And uh, these things are doctored so that the the degree of that cohomology class is zero, and then and then this this is a number. C n is a number. That's the G, and the G hat is uh, a similar power series where I multiply all those CNs by n factorial. Okay. And particularly, if you haven't really much seen this stuff, you should not worry, okay? All I need you to take home at this point is what kind of information this is. This is some functions, it's a generating series, whose coefficients have to do with rational curves of degree n on x. It's a Grumpf-Witten theoretic object. That's the left side, okay, of mirror symmetry. What about the right side? So what's pi w? And pi w of t is a classical, much more classical object. It's a standard period integral of a differential form on a cycle. And uh, here, uh, gamma is some cycle in each n of y with integer coefficients. And you know, in various situations, you would want to choose it, but typically there is only one such cycle that makes sense to consider. And omega is a normalized a volume form, an n form, holomorphic n form. Omega is a holomorphic n form on y, typically normalized such that a little what? Bigger, bigger, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 makes sense. A holomorphic n form such that uh, the integral over gamma of omega equals one, okay. Okay, so anyway, um, in these lectures, yes? We will be concerned with the low level interpretation of mirror symmetry. Sorry? Precise cycle. And uh, typically, there is only one reasonable cycle that you can consider. Why don't I, uh, I understand, I, I understand. Um, wh why don't I make this concrete, at least, uh, okay, so why don't I give you an example, okay? So then it's clear, well at least in that example, what we're talking about. You know, mirror symmetry is not exactly a science as such. Uh, it's more like a building site, okay? And uh, all these questions are, you know, completely legitimate. 
So example, P2. Okay? So x equal P2. And so here I want to take uh, the mirror to be y is just a two-dimensional torus, c star squared. And w, I want it to be the function x plus y plus 1 over x times y. Yeah? And uh, uh, the, the standard cycle gamma on y, I'm going to take a, the, the obvious thing, you know, s1 cross s1 inside y. You know, that's the set, if you like, uh, norm of x equal norm of y equal 1. And uh, omega is the invariant differential form on the torus. And if I want to normalize it so that it has integral 1, I better divide by 1 over 2 pi i squared. OK? And um, so what's the period pi w of t is just the integral over gamma of 1 over 1 minus tw uh, omega. Yeah? And so I can compute this with uh, Cauchy's theorem. So I expand this thing in power series. And so that's, that's uh, the uh, sum t to the n times the integral uh, over gamma of uh, w to the n omega. And uh, uh, by Cauchy's theorem, can you still read despite this monster object here? Am I supposed to stop at some level here? I am supposed to stop some level here. So, OK, so then that is, uh, it's, you know, by the Cauchy theorem, all, the only thing that matters here is the coefficient of 0 in, in w to the n. And so then I'm talking about some t to the n coefficient of 0 in w to the n. And so when you think about it, what's that coefficient? Uh, so you know, w to the n is x plus y plus 1 over x, y uh, to the n. And um, uh, you know, you're going to have a constant term only when you know, n is divisible by 3. And then your constant term is going to have to be some sort of binomial coefficient. You, don't, you, know, you want so many of these, exactly as many of those, and exactly as many of those. And so that's 3n over n, 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 t to the n, to t to the 3n. OK, so that's your period. On the other hand, then let me continue over here. For x equal p2, what is the function g? Uh, well, that's actually deep. Uh, this is the work of uh, Giventhal. Giventhal tells us that g for p2 g of t is uh, uh, sum um, t to the 3d divided by d factorial cube. And so indeed, the g hat equal pi. So I'm 
I'm debating with myself where I want to take this question just slightly further. Maybe, maybe I can. Right. So um, these uh, these period functions, these period functions, I W of T um, satisfy. some regular. Algebraic uh, differential equations. Uh, these are called the Picard Fuchs equations. Okay. And you know, there is some general theory that tells you that. Um, And uh, similarly, these g hat functions also satisfy some differential equations. And you know, that comes from something that happens in quantum cohomology. And another way to state the low level, a low level uh, mirror symmetry statement, though not as low level as the identity of these two functions, is to say that some uh, you know, regularized Uh, quantum differential operator here that that annihilates the g hat function equals the Picard Fuchs operator on this side, okay, and. Um, it is sometimes helpful to state mirror symmetry in this way. And uh, all I want to do here is uh, to compute the, uh, the, differential, the differential operator in question for P2, OK? So. Um, I like to write my operators as uh, in this form, sum t uh, to the k times a polynomial in D. Uh, so my sum will go from k equal not to r. And here d is t d by dt. And so this operator uh, L kills a power series. Uh, so suppose that phi of t equals sum c n t to the n. Uh, so such operator kills phi of t. Sorry? I am right, well, in principle, this works for both sides. Yes. I really only work with a G hat. 
Yeah, jihad. Yeah, yeah. But, but in fact, I'm going to do it on the pi here. Well, whatever. The thing that has that formula there. And so L times phi equals 0 uh, is equivalent to a recursion relation, uh, the linear recursion relation between the CNs uh, that reads, uh, um, I mean, please uh, let me just write down the formula. You will. Uh, we'll be able to work it out in a moment. Uh, that's C n minus k, p k n minus k equals zero, and you probably want this for all n larger than or equal r. Okay. So. Sorry? Okay, thank you. The interpretation being that uh, all the negative C's are supposed to be zero, yeah? And so, um, for P2, uh, L dot pi equals zero for L, the operator uh, d squared minus, um, okay, let me copy it so that I don't make a mistake, 27 t cubed uh, d plus 1, d plus 2. <clears throat> okay. And you know you can work that out easily from uh, the form of the coefficient, uh, th this form here. So you know that's three n factorial divided by n factorial cube, and you see the nth one of these is expressed in terms of the n minus first of these multiplied times three n, three n minus one, three n minus two divided by n cube. You work it out, and that gives you that particular operator. So another way, you know, is another low-level interpretation of mirror symmetry is an identity of two differential operators. And on a slightly higher level, then you might want to say that actually it's an isomorphism of D modules, and so on. You know, you can layer it progressively in higher and higher levels. I will use both the functions and sometimes the differential operators. Anyway, so that's an example, OK? We spoke about P2. We will have many other examples. <clears throat> so. Today, I'm not going to tell you what we will do. I'm going to tell you next time. Um, but I want to tell you somehow what the point of view here is going to be. Some of our point of view. So, you know, as I said, uh, mirror symmetry is not a finished theory. It's, a, it's more of a building site. And so here are some general, completely open questions. OK, so question one. 
How general is it? So, for instance, does do all Fano orbifolds smooth? Have a mirror. Okay, so we don't know. Um, uh, I know that for all the known Fano manifolds, the answer is yes. Uh, well, okay, so, so that would be a slightly exaggerated statement, but, but you know, not that far from the truth. I know very many Fano manifolds, and I know their mirrors, okay. But I also, in my, you know, my experience, uh, I don't know any counterexample for smooth orbifolds, okay? So we've looked at the edges of, uh, of what, what we know, and we, it seems that we can always make the mirror. Okay. Yes? Yes. 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 Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. I have a paper on this with other people. In we will talk about this uh, precisely the next time, okay? I, I will try to, uh, what's the word, uh, make you happy. Okay, so that's a question. Uh, question two. How precise is it? So what do I mean by precise? I mean, uh, can we define two sets? Okay, one set having to do with Fano orbifold, let me call it F, okay, and another mysterious set, let me call it P, which, you know, might have something to do directly with the landau gazebull model or maybe some, something else. And then, uh, you know, there, and there is a one-to-one, one-to-one, invertible function correspondence from F to P, such that then, you know, if I take something here, I take F of P, then all possible low-level, high-level mirror symmetry statements hold for that particular pair. And can we state it in this form? You know, where the sets F and P are going to be exactly defined in terms of things, and we can make sure that one is, is an element of F and one is not. Question three, okay, is it conceivable that we can make, can we make a directory, maybe a computer directory, eventually a complete classification of Fano LG pairs. So in other words, you know, and here I mean something very effective and very practical. You know, a book, like the yellow pages of Fano LG pairs. And then you have to imagine what the data set structure is going to be here, you know? There are some phone numbers in these yellow pages, and I can and I can, you know, look for the phone number and use the phone number to ring up the, the funnel 
and you know, so, and know that somebody will answer that phone, and then I and then I can rig up the LG thing, the, the its mirror, and I know for a fact that somebody will will answer that phone, and that this pair is mirror, this thing is mirrored to that thing, and if 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 uh, if you give me a funnel, then I'm going to ask the directly to me, put me in touch with its LG model, and, and it's going to be explicit and constructed, and it's going to be as a data set inside this direct. So that's the question. Completely practical, okay? So uh, what we are about, you know, in my group and people I work with, Al, who is here, uh, we're about question three. You know, our point, you know, we want to make this directory, okay? And so, you know, I just want to, and, uh, you know, this is even more of a building site and work in progress for us. So, you know, we cannot tell you the answer to this problem in this course because we don't know about it. But whatever we do in the course, we do because this is what we want to do. Okay, so when we do something, then you know why we do it in that way and not in some other way, and you don't come and complain to me. So, you see, because I can well imagine that there is a beautiful answer to question one and two, which is completely useless from the point of view of doing question three. You know, somebody may come to me and tell me that, oh yeah, I discovered this theorem, and you know, the mirror of the Landau Gizmo mirror of X is, you know, some moduli space of stable objects in the derived category of X defined on this stability condition or whatever other. And uh, that's great. I mean, it's a great and extremely satisfying theoretical statement. But I want the phone number. I want to call up that landau Gizmo model. And I want it to turn up as a data set that I can make the, the, the damn thing. Okay? So to know that it's something like that, it may not help me at all. So it's not that we don't like theory. We love theory. But I'm just telling you, because that's what we want to do we are interested in the kind of theory that helps us answer question three. Yeah? So how long are these uh, lectures supposed to last? One hour. Okay, so very good. So, um, Anyway, so in terms of context, this, uh, you know, I've told you more or less what symmetry is for us, the low level interpretation, and what our um, point of view is. So, next, um, or this, uh, you know, th this is going to be mostly the work in the next lecture. I wanted to say what we are going to try to do in this course. <clears throat> and in order to tell you that, I will sort of um, continue on. I cannot right away tell you what we plan to do. And you know, for that, I need to start with some preliminary discussion. So obviously, anyway, in terms of question three, we are interested in explicit constructions of mirror symmetry. So, you know, uh, starting from a final given with equations, what's, how can I make the LG model? And um, so 
I want to tell you about uh, one particular construction. So one of these is the the Horivafa construction. So this is described in this paper called mirror symmetry. Uh, never published from 2000. And it's in the archives, so you can pick it up. And if you like, uh, you have to look at section 7 and particular equations 7.83 and 7.84. Okay. But it's been discussed in many other places. So this is, and so you know, if you if you don't mind, I want to spend some time telling you about this thing. Um, this is for toric complete intersections. So by the way, I intend to spend a couple of hours later, maybe next week telling you about toric geometry, okay, in a way that's, that plays well with the kind of stuff that we do. How many people here have seen the basics of toric geometry before? You see, that's good. It is almost everybody, but again, you know, not everybody there raised their hands. And uh, you know, I don't want to, to talk to the people who ought to be teaching me. I mean, if, if, they, if, they, if, they, if this thing is to make sense, I have to talk to the people that I'm sure that I have something to teach to, OK? And certainly those people who did not raise their hand are such people as far as I'm concerned, right? So I, I will spend some time telling you about toric geometry, but for today, uh, well, it's not that I'm going to go very far with this. You know, from the beginning, um, what's it? So, okay, so what's a toric variety? What's a toric variety? So, <clears throat> if you open up a book on toric geometry, they start with some crazy definition that says a toric variety is already X with an action of a torus on it, such that a bunch of things happen. It's a completely ridiculous thing. Nobody wants to know what toric variety is in that way. And it's extremely inefficient to, you know, using this, the books, to what's the data set that's appropriate for telling yourself what's a toric variety. That's completely inefficient. So for me, a toric variety is just a quotient so, is a quotient Cn, well, in fact, it would be always an M, okay, modulo a R dimensional torus. Okay, so here Tr. is spec of CL and um, where L is the rank R lattice. So typically, and if you want, you can always imagine that L is isomorphic to ZR. But occasionally, it's helpful also to allow L to own some torsion. Uh, but you know that's an additional technical that's not terribly important. Where TR acts on CM as a linear representation. OK, so a vector space is CM the linear representation of a torus, and I want to take the quotient. 
And you know, you really know an example of this thing, projected space. It's Cn plus one modulo the action of C star, okay? And you already know in the case of projective space that you have to be careful. Before you take the quotient, you have to throw away the origin, okay? But then after you throw away zero, you can take the quotient. So what happens here is that, so you know, there is something subtle going on there. For tori of higher rank, there are actually different choices of taking the quotient. And uh, the stuff you throw away, the, you have, it's debatable. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about this. Uh, you need to choose a stability condition that for today we're going to ignore. But so then this is a geometric quotient of this by this taken with respect to a stability condition. And uh, you, know, you probably want to put it in square brackets because you want to think of this as an orbifold, not as a just variety. And uh, for me, torque varieties are always denoted by F. Right. But in principle, this is just not much harder than a projective space. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you by taking some of these things and carving them with charts, like you cover projective space, and just show you that you can learn to live on such a thing. And it's not going to be that much more painful than living on projective space. So uh, we'll continue the discussion next time. But to wrap this up, um, then how do, you, so how do you give yourself a toric variety? Well, um, you have to give yourself a, a data, data set for a toric vari variety. So you want a group homomorphism from Zm to L, OK? So, so which dualizes indeed to a group homomorphism from our dimensional torus dual to L to C star to the M, which acts diagonally on Cm, OK? And then. Uh, you imagine of taking the quotient. So that's how you give yourself a toric variety. And uh, let's not worry about how you choose your stability condition. Okay? And then you want to give yourself uh, line bundles on it. C line bundles, O1 up to LC, on F. Okay? And uh, a line bundle is essentially a character of your torus. So these corresponds, these are basically just elements. These, these are one of LC are basically just elements of L. So those characters allow us to define an action of the torus on Cm times another copy of C. And when you take the quotient, you act on Cm with, uh, with, with D. And you act on C via that character. And you take the quotient, so that's a line bundle on F. And then what does it mean to say that x is a toric complete intersection, then x is uh, the intersection of the variety of f1, intersection the variety of fc, where these fi's are general sections of these line bundles on f. OK? So then this x is a toric complete intersection. Sorry? Is x. 
sorry, X is a toric complete intersection in F. F. Yeah, so that X is uh, a, a complete intersection in F, okay? So here, I'm choosing C line balance on F and general sections of them, and X is just the place where all those things are zero. Okay. So tomorrow, then, I'm, I'm gonna tell you uh, when I have one of these toric complete intersections, which happens to be final, and now there are about that some silly assumptions are satisfied, then they give you something that's supposed to be the mirror of it, okay? We'll talk about this tomorrow.